Okay, welcome everybody. Um, this is our second of five, five lectures that uh, Emily, uh, Emily Banforth will be giving. Overkill or Overchill. This is talking about uh, some of the megafauna extinctions not too long ago. When we talk about extinctions, we think of beasts and animals like dinosaurs and such. Um, but we have to understand the complexity of extinctions is far too great for a simple, single thing to cause an extinction. Or that the, in this example, the dinosaur extinction was the only group of animals suffered in a mass extinction. Um, extinctions, as we know today in biology, as reflected in the fossil record, is a far more complex and uh, in-depth subject to be uh, deciphered uh, just by one, one potential cause. So, Emily will be talking about the more recent of the extinction events, some of the large megafauna uh, mammals um, in North America and elsewhere. So, on that note, Emily will inform us and enlighten us. So stuff from around this area, so I'm hoping that will be uh, good relevance for all of you. Um, so today what I'm going to be talking about is giants, ice age giants. So these are just some illustrations of the giant mammals that lived during the time of the ice age. So this particular group of animals is so important in paleontology that we've given them their own specific name. So we call this, this group of animals the Pleistocene megafauna. Now just before I start, I'd like to talk a little bit more about what both words, both of these words mean. So Pleistocene is a reference to a time period. Megafauna is reference to a type of animal. So I'll just briefly go over what those two mean. So when we talk about geologic time, um, we often simplify them by talking about, say, the age of dinosaurs and the age of mammals. Um, in a more uh, geologic sense, all of these time periods have got um, geological names. Um, and there are some misconceptions that are surround these different geologic time periods. So I just want to address some of those before I start. The first misconception is that the so-called age of mammals, um, associated with the age of mammals, came right after the dinosaurs. So to explain why this is a little bit of an oversimplification, I just want to talk briefly about the geologic time, what we call the geologic time periods. So geologic time can be divided into, into hierarchical blocks. So long periods of geologic time we refer to as eras. So the Mesozoic era was, was effectively the time of the dinosaurs. The Cenozoic era came after the dinosaurs. So everything from the dinosaur extinction to now is what we refer to as the Cenozoic era. Now, eras can be further divided into periods. So the last period of the dinosaurs was called the Cretaceous period. That's what we find primarily here in Saskatchewan, these Cretaceous dinosaurs. And the Cenozoic era can be broken into two periods, what we call the Paleogene and the Neogene. Um, some of you may remember when these were called the Tertiary and the Quaternary periods. Um, the Paleogene and the Neogene are just basically an update on those terms. <coughs> So periods can be even further divided into what we call epochs. So the Paleogene is made up of four epochs, starting with the Paleocene here. And the Neogene is divided into three epochs, so ending with the Holocene. And we currently are in the Holocene right now. So just as a reference, dinosaurs went extinct just before the Paleocene started. And you are here at the very end of the Holocene. And so if we were to put the Ice Age onto this geologic time, the Ice Age basically only covers a small portion of the Cenozoic. So from sort of the mid-Pliocene was the onset um, to the middle of the Holocene. So we're just basically coming out of that Ice Age. Um, and I should mention that these blocks are to scale. Some of these time periods were longer than others. So basically from the time the dinosaurs went extinct, to the onset of the Ice Age, there was 62 million years. There were 62 million years of the age of mammals uh, that came before the Ice Age. So has anyone out there seen the movie Ice Age? The uh, Pixar movie? Yep, it's one of my favorite movies. 
Um, but it falls into, um, it does something that, that the same that a lot of dinosaurs movie, movies do, in that it lumps all of the mammals from these time periods into one movie. Um, so if you look at Man and the Mammoth, it's probably an imperial mammoth. These animals lived during the Pleistocene, whereas this Carl, this is his name, Carl the Brontosphere, is from the Oligocene. And so this is where some of those misconceptions come from. It's from movies like Ice Age that lump all of these mammals together. Another misconception about the age of mammals um, was that it was always cold. So pretty much the dinosaurs went extinct and then Earth was cold. Um, it's actually almost the opposite of that. Um, so in this chart here, the, the warmer colors represent warmer periods in Earth's history and the cooler colors are colder periods. And you can see that right in the middle of what we call the Eocene, there was a really hot period, a hot spot. And this was called the Eocene Thermal Maxima. And this is actually the warmest period that we have ever recorded on Earth. Um, so this was a really, really, really warm period. How warm, you might ask? Well, this is a reconstruction um, from a place called Ellesmere Island. And some of you might recognize that as being an island in the high Arctic, the high Canadian Arctic. And during the Eocene, it was in the same place, it was still in the Arctic, but there was a temperate rainforest there. So this was a very warm period in Earth's history. There were no polar ice caps, and there were rainforests all the way up to the poles. So this is in stark contrast to what we consider to be the cool period, the Ice Age. Um, and this is an image from around the same place, um, so still from the Arctic, in a place called Beringia, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but in the high Arctic, and you can see that it's a very different world. So there's been a lot of climate change between the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs and now. Now I just want to briefly take a little bit of a detour and talk about some of the fossils in Saskatchewan. Um, Saskatchewan paleontology historically um, has been heavily based in the age of mammals, in the Cenozoic. So we have a lot of really important contributions to science based on the fossils that we find here in Saskatchewan from these time periods. So this is a reconstruction. It's actually from the Royal Saskatchewan Museum in Regina. Um, and this is what East End might have looked like about 37 million years ago. So this was sort of the end of the Eocene, the beginning of the Oligocene. And some of these characters you might recognize. This is a brontosphere. We have a Rothfier skeleton in our gallery up here. There's also one in the town museum. Um, so these were animals that were basically rhinos, a little bit larger than a modern rhino, and that they had these two protuberances, two horns on their head. Um, so some of the other critters that lived during this time, critters, they're actually quite large. Um, Leptomeryx was this little deer kind of creature, um, pretty common in the fossil record from this time. Um, Holophenus, this was one of the predators. These are what are referred to as bone-crushing dogs. So they had dentition that was very similar to hyenas. Um, and this is an animal, one of my favorite fossil animals of all time. Um, this is Archaeotherium. It belongs to a group called the Antilodonts, which are basically huge, scary-looking pigs, sometimes referred to as terror pigs. So they also came from this time period. Um, and I just want to mention that a lot of this reconstruction is based on a fossil locality that's quite close to here. Uh, it's called South Fork Quarry. And so this is just a, an image of um, the RSM and some of the McGill students out at this quarry. So this is Wes Long. He's like, you recognize him? Uh, this is Lee Matheson. And they're basically excavating uh, this bone bed, which is in this layer here. Uh, this is an example of a Brontothier uh, rib that we found in here. Uh, so this is a great site to work in, and again, it's somewhere local um, that has told us an awful lot about what the world was like um, during this time period in this area. So if we move forward a little bit in time, uh, there's a locality near Rock Glen um, that dates to about 14 million years old that's also really important for telling us about what the fauna was like at this time. Um, so you can see that the world is a little bit different. There's a little bit more grass. There's a little bit of fewer trees. This time period was a little bit cooler. Um, and that's sort of reflected in the overall uh, vegetation that you see. Some of the creatures in this time period, again, a little bit foreign to us. Um, 
Aphenolopes was a basically a rhino-like creature, smaller than a brontothere, but still kind of the same, um, living in the same kind of place. Um, Merichippus, this was an early horse. It actually had three toes. Um, but again, well on the way to being a modern horse, as you can see in the reconstruction. Um, but also hasn't quite reached the horse size yet, so these guys are about that big. Um, Maricotus, this was basically an antelope-like creature. And I think this is really neat because basically antelopes have been in this area for 14 million years, which is kind of cool. Um, we, also see, we also find more of these bone-crushing dogs. This is a different species, but it's the same kind of animal, would have filled the same kind of niche. Also from this time, we start finding mastodons. Um, so mastodons are different from mammoths. So a mammoth, like a woolly mammoth, is more closely related to a modern elephant than to a mastodon. Um, so mastodons were unique in having um, more of a lower jaw and also having different teeth. But they belong to the same group as elephants. They're called the proboscidea. So at this time, we start getting mastodons in Saskatchewan as well. And finally, there's a locality northeast of Swift Current um, called the Welsh Creek. Uh, this is called the Welsh Creek Fauna. Again, a really, really important um, fossil locality for us to figure out what the world was like during the, this is again, the early, now we're in the early Pleistocene, so just at the onset of the Ice Age. And some, there are some really interesting animals here. Megalonyx. This is a giant sloth. A giant sloth in Saskatchewan. Kind of blows your mind sometimes. The Imperial Mammoth. Have you heard of the Kyle Mammoth? The ma mammoth they found up near Kyle? That belongs to this, this group. So at this time we're actually finding woolly mammoths in this area. Um, things like ox, oxen. This is called a shrub ox. Um, very similar to um, an animal that you would find in, say, Africa today. Um, again, still getting more of these, these hyena-like dogs, and they're still around. Um, another really impressive predator we start finding is something called the American lion. Looks like a modern lion until you start looking at the size. So this is a human for scale, this is an American lion, and this is a male African lion. So these were really, really big lions. Um, also in this area, we start getting things like short-faced bears, which are, if you can imagine a bear that's twice the size of a grizzly bear with long legs, that's basically what a short-faced bear looks like. Um, as well as some of the, the saber-toothed cats are still around this area as well, at this time as well. Um, so this was a period where there was a lot of really big animals, particularly a lot of big predators. Um, so. Again, that age of mammals in Saskatchewan is very variable, and we have a lot of great fossils that tell us a lot about what this time period was like. Now, just really briefly, I want to talk about where humans come in, because this talk is basically an interaction what happened between those megafauna, those Ice Age mammals, and humans. So, when did humans arrive on the scene? So, and this is just a very, very brief overview. Human, um, the human fossil record is very complicated, so this is just a very simplified view of that. So the earliest possible hominid um, appeared sometime at the end of the Miocene. Um, this particular specimen is called Sashantopus, and it came from Chad in Africa. So this is dated to about 7 million years ago. Again, that was the end of the, Mi the Miocene. By the Pliocene, uh, we start getting things that are definitely hominids. Um, things like Australopithecus. So you may have heard of Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis. Uh, this is her skeleton here. Possibly one of the most famous fossil humans ever found. So she came from this time period, from, from the Pliocene. Again, this is just before the onset of the Ice Age. Um, Homo erectus, which you've probably heard of, um, this is sort of the next step in, um, in human evolution. Homo erectus was a very long-standing, very widespread taxa. So it was found in most places in the old world, and it was around for a long time. Um, sort of towards the end of the, the, Pleist the Pleistocene, we start getting a group of humans that are generally referred to as archaic humans. 
Um, so these are things like Homo hyloburgensis, Homo neanderthalus, so neanderthals fit into this group. Um, Homo rudolfensis, Homo ant ant antecedents. This, the, all of these groups are referred to as archaic humans, and they started appearing sort of towards the end of the Pleistocene. And anatomically modern humans, so basically humans that are fully modern, not only look like humans, but are doing very human things like cave painting, music, burial rituals, things like that. They started to appear only about 100,000 years ago. Um, so for paleontologists, that's incredibly recent. That was like yesterday. Um, so this is basically where humans fit into the, the scale. And so again, we're talking about the Pleistocene. And the humans I'm referring to in this talk um, are these modern humans. So the Pleistocene was a very in interesting time period um, geographically as well. Um, at this time, there was actually a land bridge between uh, Asia, between Siberia, and Alaska. So I'll just highlight where the modern shorelines are. So those dotted lines are where the modern shorelines are. So during the Pleistocene, there was actually land covering, um, or basically it was a bridge between the Arctic Ocean, um, a bridge run between the Arctic Ocean. And this was really important because this means, meant that animals from Asia could come over to North America, and animals from North America come, could come over to Asia. So it was basically a biological interchange. Another important key factor at this time um, was that we were in an ice age. So the continent was effectively covered in ice. Um, this is about where East End is. Um, East End was one of the very few places in North America that was not covered with ice. Um, Edmonton was another one. But pretty much the rest of the continent was just a huge ice sheet. Um, so on the eastern side of the continent, there was the Laurentide ice sheet. It's this massive, massive sheet of ice that covered um, hundreds of thousands of square kilometers. Um, and on the west, we had the Cordilleran ice sheet that was effectively coming over from the Rocky Mountains. But these two ice sheets didn't quite touch. So between them, there was this land, there was this exposed land that didn't have ice in it. And this is referred to as the ice-free corridor. And this is, again, really important for biology because it meant that animals that were coming over the Bering Strait could come down through this ice-free corridor into the Americas um, and to populate um, North and South America. And it, really important for the history of humans is that this was the time that we, well, there's been some debate, but this is the time that we definitively think that humans migrated into the Americas. So they crossed the Bering Land Bridge from Siberia, came down to the Ice Cream Corridor, and into South America. Um, so this is a really, really key factor for human migration, is this fact that uh, Asia, sorry, Alaska, and Siberia were connected. So that's basically what that term Pleistocene means. Now just to briefly talk about what the word megafauna means. So megafauna is Greek. It basically means just large animal. Um, so technically, this term refers to any animal that's over 100 pounds or 44 kilograms. Um, in practice, this what when we say megafauna, what we basically refer to are mammals that are bigger than people, effectively. So today, that refers to things like elephants, giraffes, hippos, rhinos, great apes, large bovids, um, whales. Um, even things like capybaras, capybaras are rodents, so they're the only rodent that actually fits into that megafauna group. Um, and again, most of the mammals in the Pleistocene were megafauna. Uh, so this is just an illustration of the megafauna that came come from a place in Colorado, very similar to what we're finding in Saskatchewan. So again, the imperial mammoth, mastodons, giant sloths. This here is a giant beaver called Castorites. So if it was standing up like this, it would have come up to about here. So it really was a gigantic beaver. Um, as well as this whole suite of other really large mammals. Uh, there's a dire wolf there, another really important predator. Um, there's a short-faced bear. That's the lion. That's the short-faced bear. So basically, these are really big mammals. And what's interesting about the Pleistocene megafauna is that it wasn't just in North America. So while there were 
gigantic lions, gigantic elk, gigantic sloths, gigantic everything, basically in North America. There are also gigantic animals in South America. This is the what's called the Shasta ground sloth. So this stood about it was two and a half meters at the shoulder. So a very, very big animal. Even places like Australia had giant megafauna. Uh, so this is a marsupial lion that was about the size of a modern lion. So this is an interesting trend if you consider that places like Australia weren't connected to the rest of the world. It was an island continent already, and yet the mammals were getting gigantic, just like mammals in the rest of the world. Um, so this is a little bit of a conundrum in paleontology. Uh, we don't really know what drove this trend for mammals to get really, really big, except mammals are not the only group this has been seen in. Um, so generally, when we have a whole um, suite of animals from a particular group getting very large at the same time, we refer to this trend as giganticism. And giganticism has been noted in insects. So in a time period called the Carboniferous, there were dragonflies that were as long as your arm. There were millipedes that were a meter and a half long. Um, so if you compare those insects to the insects you get today, um, you can see that there's been a trend into giganticism that has um, then declined. Um, same thing with amphibians. Some of the very first amphibians we find were gigantic. They're sort of a meter or two meter in length. Um, and if you think about most amphibians that we have today, um, they're really little guys, little frogs, little salamanders. So amphibians went through a giganticism trend as well. Dinosaurs as well. The di largest dinosaurs we know of were in the Jurassic period. These were the, the sauropods. Um, some of the, they were in fact the largest land mammals that ever lived. Um, and if you think about the ancestors of dinosaurs today, the descendants of dinosaurs today, things like birds. And so we've had, again, this trend towards giganticism that has then, and the animals have then shrunk. So we see this in mammals. So giganticism in mammals started basically right after the extinction. So what these graphs show is that this is the, the mass of mammals. This is what we call a log scale. Um, so this, this is basically orders of magnitude. So from 1 to 10, 10 to 100, these are order of magnitude increases. And this is time on this axis, and this red line represents the dinosaur mass extinction. So what this is basically showing is that mammals before the extinction were pretty small. Um, there were a few trends towards getting bigger before the extinction, but for the most part mammals were small. And then as soon as the dinosaurs went extinct, um, a lot of these mammal groups just took off in terms of body size. Um, so again, during the time of the dinosaurs and Mesozoic, mammals were pretty small. Uh, most mammal animals were up between the size of a shrew and the size of a house cat. During the Cenozoic, we have this trend towards getting huge. Um, for example, this is an animal called Indrakitherium, and this is an actual scale of what it would look like. So this is basically a rhino-like creature that would have stood taller than an elephant. Um, and then we're now getting into a trend where mammals are again getting smaller. So we still have large mammals, things like elephants, rhinos, hippos, but for the most part mammals are smaller today than they were in the Ice Age. And so now we get into the debate that has been um, in the scientific world for quite a few decades. And that is, what caused the decline of these Ice Age giants? Um, so beginning about 50,000 years ago, there were waves of mass extinction that wiped out these giant mammals. Um, the only ones that really survived were in Africa. Um, so things like, again, elephants, rhinos, hippos, they're considered to be the only surviving um, megafauna that exists in large groups. What's interesting about these extinctions was that they weren't synchronous. They didn't happen all at once. They seemed to happen, as I said, in waves. Um, so, megafauna in Australia seemed to disappear first, uh, followed by those in Northern Asia, um, and then South America, and finally Madagascar. Um, so the question is still out there about what caused these waves of extinction. Um, so just again to illustrate the fact that the world today is a very different place in terms of the mammals that we have. Um, this graph here shows sort of the existing, or the megafauna that survived those extinctions. Um, and they're mostly in Africa and in places like Indonesia. 
all of these animals outlined in white went extinct. And you can see that, again, this is just a graph that shows body size, so in body size in different continents. Um, the, the gray bars there are an existing fauna. The white bars are fauna that went extinct. Um, so this quote from Alfred Russell Wallace, who was a very famous biologist, pretty much summed it up. He says, we live in a zoologically impoverished world in which all of the hugest, the fiercest, and the strangest forms have recently disappeared. And it is, no doubt, a much better world for us now they've gone. Fair enough. Yet it is surely a marvelous fact, and one that has hardly been sufficiently dwelt on, that the sudden dying out of so many large mammalia, not in one place and time, but over half the land surface of the globe. So basically, Alfred Russell Wallace is saying, this is weird, that there are all these large mammals, and suddenly they went extinct, but not all at once, and not all in one place. So why was this? Well, it can hardly escape notice that humans and these Pleistocene megafauna existed at the same time for quite a long period of time. So we know this from not only archaeological evidence, but also things like cave paintings. So these are very famous cave paintings in a place called the Chauvet Co uh, Caves in France. They're dated to about 32 million years, uh, years ago. And these are clearly paintings of Pleistocene megafauna. So we have things like woolly rhinos. We have things like um, large lions that would have, uh, cave lions would have existed at the time. Um, things like aurochs. Um, there's also mastodons and elephants depicted in this cave, and so it's clear that humans and Pleistocene megafauna coexisted at the same time. So, that leaves the question, did humans do it? Were humans the reason that these Pleistocene megafauna went extinct? And so, these two theories are sort of jokingly called overkill, which is the theory that humans caused the extinctions, and over chill, which is the theory that climate change caused the extinctions. Um, so I just want to talk, I'll talk briefly about both of the, the debates on both sides, and then you can come up with yourself which you think is more plausible. So to start with the overkill hypothesis, um, this was effectively proposed by a gentleman called Paul Martin. Um, and his term for this, he called the overkill hypothesis the Blitzkrieg hypothesis. Um, and he basically said that the way that we can explain the Pleistocene extinctions is because humans colonized the areas, and as they colonized these areas, as they migrated into the modern world, they caused these mass extinctions. Um, and this may have been due to um, humans suddenly becoming really, really good at hunting, which is plausible. Humans are known for their ability to innovate. Um, and so this is a quote from Paul Martin's paper. This is about in, in the 1970s when this was, was uh, proposed. So the quote he has was, during an episode of faunal extinction, the population of North America need not exceed 600,000 people. So there didn't need to be more than 600,000 people in the world, uh, or North America. Um, it requires that at the front, and I'll explain what that means in a second, one person in four destroys one animal unit per week. Extinction could happen within a decade. So this was his, his hypothesis. Um, and I should just mention that a lot of what, his, what he's holding here is actually um, a coprolite. It's fossil dung from an animal called a sloth. And so, what's an animal called a sloth? This is a Shasta ground sloth, um, one of those really giant sloths. And his observation was that there was a lot of sloth coprolite before humans were in the area, and virtually none after humans were in the area. Uh, so that was basically his first observation that led to this hypothesis. And so he basically said that as humans moved down that ice-free corridor into North America, um, they would have formed basically a hunting front as they moved forward. Um, and so as they moved forward in these waves, they would have successively killed off the megafauna. Um, so this is what was his depiction of it. So as you get these waves of human migration, you have these waves of extinction that follow it. So Paul Martin suggested that the culprit um, for these extinctions was, was Clovis humans. So these were basically one of the first groups of humans that we have evidence of coming into to North America across the Barren Lands Bridge. 
and they have very distinctive um, projectile points, which is how um, they're identified. Um, so these are just basically all of the places in North and South America where Clovis points have been found. Um, so because they were all over the place and they're dated to about the right time, they're a good. Um, they're basically a good candidate for causing these extinction in Paul Martin's overkill hypothesis. Um, so this debate, this hypothesis was not immediately accepted. There was a lot of debate that went back and forth. Um, there were people that said, absolutely no way, there's no way this could be true. There were people that were totally on board with it. Um, and so this debate has been going on for about three or four decades, and, and is still going on today. So what are some of the evidence for overkill? What is some of the support? Well, one of the strongest for supports for this hypothesis is that these extinctions are very rapid. Um, they took place over a very short period of time. Um, so for example, this is the, this graph depicts the large mammal population of the continent in green. And this arrow here represents the time that humans appeared. And you can see that in everywhere except Africa, as soon as humans appeared, there was a really very rapid decline in the number of large mammal taxa. Um, so just as an aside, how do we know that humans appear in an area? How is that actually, how is the date actually put onto that? Uh, well, archaeologists look for things like, obviously, material remains, things like projectile cores or stone tools. Um, they look for an increase in charcoal particulates, because humans at this time were using fire. Um, so this was a, a good way of figuring out if humans had been in an area. And at this time, even then, humans were introducing species into an area. Um, plant, both plants and animals, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. Um, so these are all ways that people have actually figured out when humans arrived. Um, so if you look at a graph like this, you may say, yeah, it does look like when humans appeared, mammals went extinct. These big mammals went extinct. So um, it does really look like humans were involved. Um, just another uh, point about extinction. So normally when things go extinct because of something like climate change, there's a successive pattern that they follow. So the first thing that will happen with, is that they'll start changing physical things about them. So they'll grow a warmer fur coat. Um, they'll do things like maybe they'll start hibernating longer, they'll start migrating longer, they'll start migrating sooner or later. So that's what this phenotypic and phenologic changes mean. So that's the first thing that happens. If the climate change persists, um, species will tend to expand their ranges. So they'll go further south, they'll go further north, um, they'll go up mountains, they'll go down mountains. Um, they'll basically try and move to where the climate is more to their liking. Um, and eventually, if none of that works over a period of about a, a, a million years, that species will actually go extinct. So this is sort of the expected trajectory of species extinction. Um, and so if there was climate change at this point that was causing these mammals to go extinct, um, it must have been really, really rapid. Um, and so this particular graph doesn't really support the idea of climate change because the, the extinctions were so rapid that it seems as if something else was causing them as well. The second um, support for this overkill extinction is this idea of preferential hunting. So we know for sure that these early humans were not just killing everything, they had specific taxa that they targeted for food. Um, so basically the idea is that are you going to spend all of your time and energy running around after rabbits? Or are you just going to kill a mammoth and feed your, your family or your community for a month or two? Um, so it's clear that humans were hunting what are called big game. Um, so basically more food for unit effort. Um, and this is reflected in a lot of archaeological sites. So we know that humans were hunting larger taxa. And it does seem as if it was the larger taxa that were going extinct. So again, on this, this graph here, this is body mass or body size. Um, and on this graph is the number of species. And you can see that as the species get larger, the more go extinct. So this is defined that this is overall. And this is just uh, in different groups. Um, so you can see that in almost all of the groups, the larger the taxa were, the more likely they were to go extinct. 
Um, so this is evidence for the overkill hypothesis because it's reflective of preferential hunting. Um, a third line of evidence is that, as I mentioned, the megafauna we have today are in Africa. Um, so things like lions, um, elephants, rhinos, hippos, those are the megafauna that survived. And the theory is that if humans went into other continents and killed all the megafauna, the reason that the ones in Africa survived was because they were used to humans. So humans have been in Africa since time immemorial. And so the megafauna that were there uh, knew how to avoid human predation. And so that's why they survived. And the megafauna in other continents that weren't used to humans didn't. So that's another line of evidence. Um, there's evidence of kill sites. So this is basically where humans, uh, ancient humans had killed animals and they actually butchered them. Um, so we actually find things like butcher marks on mammoth bones. So we know for sure that humans were killing mammoths. Um, and so yeah, we also know, again, from these kill sites that humans were targeting these, these larger fauna. Um, another line of evidence has to do with what's called the keystone herbivore hypothesis. Um, and this is basically the idea that large herbivores, so in, in the modern world, things like elephants, these animals are so big that when they, um, they actually can modify their environments. For example, elephants will knock over trees, um, and that changes the environment so that other animals can live there. Um, and the idea was that if humans were going in and preferentially killing these large mammals, um, they would have effectively taken away those ecosystem engineers so that all of the animals that relied on those changing environments would then not survive. Um, so this is something that was proposed, um, but one of the problems associated with this was that in the more recent extinction of the bison, so the American bison went extinct pretty much when Europeans came in and shot them all. Um, instead of going extinct, the animals that relied on the bison um, to keep the plains plains instead of growing forests, um, they actually didn't go extinct, they just moved. Um, so there is some evidence against this particular hypothesis, but this is one line of evidence that people have, have looked at. So arguments against the overkill hypothesis. So one of these is that we still, um, even as recently as the ice, the ice Age, we still have problems with dating. Um, not necessarily the methods that we have, but the material that we have to date um, is, is often, we can't find a lot of it. Um, so this leads to this question about, does the first evidence of, say, human hunting, human migration, does this actually indicate the first time this happened? So for example, if we find a kill site, or a bone that has a butcher mark on it, does that mean this is the very first time that humans killed a mammoth in this area? Or could humans have come in sooner and be killing mammoths all the time, but this was just the very first time that one appeared in the archaeological record? So this is a really big problem um, that we still don't really have a solution for. Another problem is that there were just not enough people in North America. So this is the argument. Um, so this is an argument by someone who is against the, um, the overkill hypothesis, who says, simply put, a hunting and gathering society had little need to kill animals except to satisfy the needs for food, clothing, and shelter, all of which the ancient bison could supply. So basically what he's talking about is that the, um, the First Nations, the indigenous people in North America, used bison as a source of food, um, clothing, and shelter, but they never killed more than they needed, simply because they couldn't afford to spend that time and energy. Um, so this is in stark contrast to when the Europeans started coming in and started to just shoot the bison for fun. Um, this is a little bit of a horrifying picture. These are all bison skulls from North America. This is a guy standing on top of a, a mountain of bison skulls. Um, so I'm sure that you all know that the extinction of the American bison was simply because people went out there and shot them all. Um, so this is 
the kind of, um, this really was basically a blitzkrieg, was that all these animals were destroyed over a very short period of time. Um, but the argument is that these early North Americans were not big game hunters. They weren't out there to shoot every bison they could find just for fun. They were there to hunt animals so that they could survive. Um, and so the argument is that there simply were not enough human beings in North America to kill enough animals to cause the extinction if they were just hunting for subsidence. So this is actually a really strong line of evidence against the overkill hypothesis. Um, another thing that's a little bit problematic is that if we again look at that idea that humans were preferential hunters, if they were only killing the big things, um, some people can't help but notice that some of the little things were also going extinct. Um, so things in the smaller size ranges, again, red is the extinct taxa, a lot of them were surviving, but some of them were also going extinct. Um, so this is sort of evidence against the overkill hypothesis, because if it was just humans causing the extinction, why were all these little things going extinct as well? And uh, the other thing I should mention was that um, it wasn't only the herbivores that went extinct. A lot of these giant predators, the, the lion, the, uh, the bear, um, the wolves, the dire wolves, things like, that, things like that, they also went extinct. And humans typically don't hunt these kind of animals for food. Um, just because we don't tend to eat large carnivores. We tend to eat herbivores um, for a variety of reasons. Um, so if the argument was that humans were killing off the food source of these large predators, um, and that was why the predators were going extinct, it doesn't explain why predators that ate everything instead of just one, um, one particular food source were also going extinct. So there's a little bit of inconsistency in the, um, the idea that only large mammals went extinct because of humans. Another problem, large prey are dangerous. Um, there's this idea about why would you go out and hunt a woolly, rhino, a, a woolly mammoth or a woolly rhino if you could go out and kill, say, a horse or a bison. Um, it doesn't really make sense that humans initially, when they go into a new, a new place, they would immediately go and kill the largest and the fiercest animals. Um, that just doesn't really make sense from the human psyche. Um, there are, are enough mammoth kill sites to suggest that maybe humans had gone in to kill, started to kill mammoths once they'd learned to do it properly. Um, but it doesn't make sense that when they initially go went to North America, they would immediately start killing these very large and ferocious creatures. So this is, now the question is, well, if humans didn't do it, why else would these large uh, I say mammals go extinct. Um, well, the most um, strong alternative hypothesis is climate change. This idea that the climate was changing and that the animals couldn't keep up, and so they went extinct. Um, other popular hypotheses have to do with hypervirulent diseases. Um, so diseases that were very widespread, wiping out a large number of taxa. This is sort of um, akin to what's happening with amphibians in the world today. Um, there's a fungus that's killing off a lot of amphibians regardless of what taxa they belong to. So something like hypervalian disease may have also played a role. Um, and also things like fire, uh, particularly in places like Australia. Widespread forest, there's evidence of widespread forest fires in these places that may also have significantly contributed to extinctions. Um, so, as I mentioned, the overchill hypothesis, the idea that climate change is causing these extinctions, is probably the strongest alternative hypothesis to the overkill idea. Um, it doesn't really, one of the biggest arguments against the overchill hypothesis is that the extinctions weren't synchronous. Like, you, if you would expect that global climate change was happening all at once, you'd expect all of the extinctions to happen at once. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, so if you look at this graph here, these wiggly lines basically indicate climate change um, during the Ice Age. And if we were to map on top of that the extinction of the Ice Age mammals, you can see they don't quite match up. Um, so this is one of the strongest arguments against the overchill hypothesis. Um, as mentioned, it's, it's often difficult to correlate human activity 
activities with changing climate over time. So it's hard to say that there's climate change exactly at this point, but it's hard to actually pinpoint what the fauna we're doing at the same time. Um, and there's also this idea that species may have reacted differently um, to climate change on different continents. So we know that animals in Australia were very different from animals in North America. And so climate change may not have affected them all at the same time in the same way. So generally, just the, this is just a summary slide about effectively saying that the jury is still out there. Um, and as Tim was mentioning at the very beginning, it looks as if the Ice Age extinctions, like all of the extinctions in the fossil record, were multi-causational. They weren't caused by one thing, but they were caused by a variety of factors that basically caused a perfect storm that led to extinctions. Um, so in this graph here, the red box indicates the arrival of humans. The blue box indicates the onset of the Ice Age. So you can see that the onset of the Ice Age and the arrival of humans was different in different continents. Um, and the color of the icons here, so these animals, animal icons represent the Ice Age megafauna. Um, the blue indicates probable extinction by climate change. The red indicates probable extinction by humans. So you can see that depending on what continent you are on, the influence of humans and climate change was different. So for example, in Australia, um, there's very strong evidence that humans were the cause of the Ice Age extinctions. Whereas a place, um, in the case of Europe, there's much more stronger evidence that climate change was a factor. Um, but again, it seems as if all over the world these extinctions were caused by multiple factors. But humans were involved. Um, so I'll just end with this quote from uh, Kemp, who sums it up pretty well when he says, was the end Pleistocene megafaunal extinction the last of many acts of biotic reorganization in unbridled nature, or the first act, the first of many acts of global devastation by uncontrolled humanity? So I think that pretty much sums up the debate um, in a nutshell. So thank you very much for again for listening, and I hope you found that was um, interesting and informative. Um, again, as Tim mentioned, this is part of a lecture series. Um, we have three more coming up. Um, they're running bi-weekly. So the next one is on April 11th, and this is on Mary Anning, who's a very famous um, fossil hunter from England, and the history of women in paleontology. So I hope you'll join us for that. Again, thank you for coming. And if you have questions, I would be happy to try and answer them.